Well, ohayou gozaimasu for those in Japan. Konbonwa, good evening to everyone in the United States. I know we have visitors and guests from around the world. I believe we have about 145 people who registered for this event. So we're really happy to see that. And I, I can see there are more people coming in. So welcome, welcome to our program, which is on Kancha in the Kitchen, the Japanese approach to sourcing, preparing, and partaking of food. So we'll, we'll have more information about that in a moment. And at the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, we've been, been back to mostly in-person events for a while, but we are really excited to offer this content for you online this evening or this morning for those of you in Japan. And if you're not familiar with the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, we have been in operation since 1970, and our basic mission is to connect Japanese Americans in North Texas, and today we're doing it all around the world. We connect through this through programming in business and networking, social and cultural events, education and outreach, international exchange, and our newest area, Japanese language classes. You can learn more at jasdfw.org, and we'll share a link in our chat box in a moment. For this pro program, please share your speaker questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will share your questions later in the program with our speaker and our moderator will join us in about halfway through the event as well. If you would like to share a comment on the event or need assistance with technical issues, please write in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Please note that this program is being recorded and we plan to share a link with all attendees later in the week. Lastly, we cannot do programming like this without your support. If you would like to show your support and, and really support the commitment to the understanding of Japanese culture and Japan, please consider a small gift. Shortly, I will share a link in the chat box as well. I would now like to welcome our distinguished speaker, Elizabeth Ando. She has become a leading English language authority on Japanese culinary culture. She's the author of many books, including Washoku, Recipes from the Japanese Home Kitchen, and she is the winner of the Jane Grigson Award for Academic Ex Excellence in Food Writing. If you would like to know more about her, we will also share this in the chat box. So now I would like to welcome Elizabeth Ando to the stage for the beginning of our program. I've just released the sound, and you can now see me in my bookcase. Feel free to begin, Elizabeth. I think Madoka is getting ready okay. the screen as well. Great. Well, I start with Kansha. Delighted to have this opportunity. Really grateful uh, and appreciative uh, to greet people outside of Tokyo. With the pandemic, I can't travel around like I used to. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to bring uh, a message, to make a connection with, with people. Um, the word kancha, those two yellow calligraphy that you see in the middle of the, uh, the screen, uh, mean appreciation, gratitude, and it's a common word in, in society in general. It, it's not necessarily a culinary word, but when we're talking about um, culinary uh, kancha, we're talking about really two things. We're talking about acknowledging and being grateful for what nature provides, and uh, also for people resourceful, clever people who take what the bounty that nature provides and are able to feed themselves and, and other people. Um, so the focus of what I want to talk to you about today, I have a precious few moments um, to do that, is the culinary aspect of Kancha, and it will mm, overflow, if you will, into a larger discussion. So let's start with the first screen. What does kancha in the kitchen look like when you're talking about food? And practicing kancha, meaning really taking it to heart and applying it to what you're doing. I think the first and most important point to make is that from the very start, you plan to use everything that's edible. You look at your food resource, whatever it might be at that particular moment in time and place, um, and imagine the most that you can do with it. Um, and in that process, you'll find a creative opportunity to utilize um, bits and pieces that often have been discarded um, 
and not utilized at all. So um, Ty, uh, the large snapper that you see um, pictured here, um, that's not me and that's not my husband who caught it. It's actually one of his friends who caught that fish. And um, it means omedetai or congratulations and is often a fish that's presented on a happy occasion or to celebrate something. Um, what may not be immediately obvious is that the head is eaten. It's called kabuto ni. Kabuto is actually a helmet. It's usually split in half and it's uh, soy stewed. Uh, the picture that you see in the lower left has it with gobo, which is burdock root, and lots of ginger on top. Um, people talk about the cheek. Um, I happen to like the collar uh, best, the piece that's in the back. The two uh, images on the lower uh, right are probably more obvious, uh, sashimi or otsukuri, the fresh slices uh, beautifully arranged with a little curlicue of carrot and some shiso behind it, and um, broiled or grilled um, uh, down there. What's immediately above it is something called nikogori. And once you've finished enjoying the fish the first time round, the carcass. Uh, produces uh, excellent flavor and uh, gelatin along with it, just like it would with uh, chicken or, or beef or other uh, animal protein. And little bits and pieces that might have gotten lost uh, in the process can be included with it. And on top is some grated ginger and uh, a scallion. So that's the fish version. And if we look at the next slide, Here's the uh, vegetable version. And the typical um, vegetable that's chosen to demonstrate this is a daikon. It is probably one of the most versatile, if not the most versatile um, vegetables in uh, the Japanese repertoire. Uh, the goes from sweet to uh, spicy is what it says on the top. And each of those sections actually has its own personality. Although any part of the daikon could be used possibly for um, almost any kind of uh, recipe that calls for daikon, there are certain preferences. And for example, even the same oroshi, the same grated daikon, when you're looking for um, a, a kick to it, you're going to use the tip. Um, when you're looking for something that's sweeter, you're going to use the neck uh, portion. Not only are the different segments of the daikon mm, different personalities of flavor, but the way in which you cut it uh, is going to change an impact on your enjoyment level of it. And um, the finer that you uh, cut it or chop it, uh, the texture is going to change, the release of uh, the flavonoids are going to change. Um, so the daikon can typically be done in at least five or six different ways um, at a meal on the top. It's almost done like a steak um, and then a little bit of uh, soy sauce around it with ginger on top. Um, various different um, dishes that can be made with it. So let's take a look at the next slide. When you're cooking in the kitchen, you've got your intended ingredients, whether it's a snapper or a daikon. Uh, but typically in most Asian households, um, rice is part of the meal. Uh, the word for cooked rice, gohan, is the same word as the word for a meal, gohan. Um, so it's sort of presumed that it's going to be part of it. And any procedure, any uh, activity that you're going to be doing that often, even if you're not making it every day, you're going to be making it several times a week, um, you need to be mindful of what the byproduct is, what's, what's being produced in that process. And for washing rice, it's something called togijiru. I call it liquid gold because it has so many um, wonderful uses uh, in the kitchen. And again, as with many things, not just in the kitchen, but also in terms of the household. And it can be saved. And when um, you're looking at the sediment on the bottom, that's what's on my fingers in, in the uh, picture on the, uh, the left. And some of the uses are being demonstrated in, in the picture on the right. Um, the primary culinary use is to tender prep vegetables. If you've ever enjoyed um, melt in your mouth, tend 
daikon. It's because it was prepped in togijiru before it was cooked in a broth, uh, particularly true of um, oden, but also something like furofuki, which is often finished with the miso sauce. For anyone who loves ceramic and particularly uh, rough porous um, earthenware, uh, one of the other uses for togijiru is to seal those cracks to prevent um, an excess of cooking liquids from being absorbed into them and possibly causing some mold. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to fill them up in a large pot, uh, barely bring it to a simmer, let it cool down. As is often the case in the Japanese kitchen, it's the cooling down process that's just as important as the actual heating process. Um, and it does get a bit messy, as you can see with the picture with the Otoshi Buddha on top and the, um, the Togijiru uh, flowing over. The other use is to deodorize hands in pots. So if you've been chopping garlic um, and your fingers smell that way, uh, rub them with some of the Togijiru, particularly the, um, the sediment, and lo and behold, your, the smell is gone. Um, if you've made a wonderful stew, uh, but the pot continues to smell of it, particularly true of curries, um, put some togijiru in it, bring it to a boil, let it cool down naturally, and then rinse it out. Lo and behold, um, all the odor is gone. So let's take a look at the next slide. One of the other things that uh, is consumed in great quantity is tea, hopefully ito and tea. And um, those tea leaves can be used for many different things. They're used in a culinary sense, as in you can cook with them, um, but as well as prepare a, a, an infusion to drink with your meal. Um, but it has cleaning and insect repellent um, properties to it. And anyone who is using wooden implements, uh, what you see in the upper right there is me um, finishing off my hyundai, the uh, wooden tub in which I uh, season rice for making sushi. And uh, it will keep mold from forming and particularly from unwanted creatures from taking up residence. Um, if you've got a wooden cutting board, if you have another wooden surface, uh, the next time you drink tea, um, make sure that you use it to wipe down um, those surfaces. Uh, the little, what I have uh, put my leaves in is one of those little bags that makes it easier to use um, later. But the tea itself can also be repurposed. And um, two different ways in which that happens. One is something called skudani, and that's more like a stew, a soy stew. And the other is furikake, and that's more like a, a sprinkle. Uh, both of them are great with rice. Um, one of the ones that I particularly like is a combination of uh, toasted sesame. And the little fish that you see there are chirimenjako. They're um, sardines that um, have been interrupted in their life cycle, if you will, for culinary pleasure. And the other picture is a sweeping tatami mats. Um, people are using, uh, living in tatami matted rooms less frequently now. Uh, they are absolutely the best way to, um, to clean tatami is, is um, chagara, the leftovers from drinking tea. Um, but it also works well on uh, other surfaces, wooden, and even on uh, linoleum. Uh, it seems to remove odor, uh, particularly in the kitchen, and um, also will pick up all of the other bits and pieces that are often missed by an ordinary uh, broom. So let's take a look at the next picture. Kancha also means savoring seasonal bounty. So it's not just about avoiding waste. It's about a creative opportunity to use the bounty. And um, at this time of year, it's the glory of bamboo shoots. And the notion of creating an entire meal to feature a single ingredient. And that concept or that pattern of, of meal is known as tsukushi and whatever it is that you're glorifying, in this case, takenoko, the glory of bamboo shoot. So it becomes takenoko zukushi. Kondate is a menu or an arrangement of, of various dishes. 
And the uh, image on the right shows again, much like our daikon, theoretically, almost any dish could be made from any portion of the bamboo shoot, but there are certain segments that are more applicable for certain dishes than others. And uh, again, when they've been boiled and you're ready to cook with them, you would think about the most optimal use for each of those sections. Um, I happen to have a, um, a neighbor who has a bush that with uh, the Sancho leaves, and I have permission, not too often, but uh, maybe once or twice a week during the season to go and uh, forage uh, off of her bush. And so I have an abundance of kiyome, that's what those green leaves are. They're the leaf of a pepper uh, plant and they're wonderfully uh, fragrant. Um, my relatives in Shikoku um, send uh, bamboo shoots whole to me every year uh, at this time and um, uh, cook them off. The picture that might not be mm, immediately obvious is the one in the collage on the lower right. My hand is holding, uh, again, an aspic, a, a, a gelatin. This time, because it's it was in my book, Ancha, which turned out to be vegan um, and vegetarian, it's not uh, ordinary uh, gelatin, but rather content. And uh, asparagus in there, along with bits and pieces of the um, bamboo shoot that would otherwise have not found a home. In other words, in cutting it, I'm left with bits and pieces, and that was a wonderful way in which to use it. So let's take a look at the next slide. Um, people often ask, where does this mindset come from, this approach, this attitude? And I would say from practice and most of the education is observing and living in a society that engages with Kansha on a regular level. But um, fairly recently it became a part of the official curriculum in schools in 2005 uh, is something known as Shoku Iku. Those are the two yellow characters in the upper left. Um, and literally food education, um, what is it? It's really respect for the environment and uh, of the images on the lower part, um, that's a high school group, uh, umi gomi zero, let's go to zero waste for our oceans. Um, and uh, the high schools, depending upon where they are, will sometimes uh, work in coordination with um, farmers in their uh, area, or uh, this was a, a port uh, city, and the high school students are regularly assigned to sweep, sweep and clean the beaches and um, take care of um, cleanup. Um, the other interesting part is palate training, and that's what the image on the, on the upper right there is. And from a very early age, um, these kids are in Yochien, um, so that's maybe five, uh, four or five-year-olds. Um, they're being given the vocabulary to talk about different flavors. So the teacher is holding up some lemons, and the kids are pointing uh, to the one that says sour. Um, and not only does their palate begin to recognize it, but they're given the vocabulary to talk about it and think about it. Um, and then on the bottom, the third sort of uh, prong of shoku iku is the skillful use of resources. And um, those are uh, tegakunen. So there may be mm, maybe 10 years old, if that, um, learning how to. Um, deal with a fish, a whole fish, and use it in much the same way that that first slide showed so that nothing goes to waste. Um, so from a very early age, uh, children are being given examples uh, to follow and they're being given the skills to be able to um, continue to nurture Kancha from one generation to the next. So can we have the next slide? Yeah, thanks. So I'd like to now throw it into your corner. It's your turn <laughs> to practice Kancha in the kitchen. 
and um, wanting you to be mindful of repurposing what would otherwise be considered scraps, kitchen scraps. And um, there are four dishes in the Japanese repertoire that are particularly amenable to doing that. Um, one of them is something called takikomi gohan. Takikomi means that you're cooking in flavor as you're cooking the gohan, the rice. And the example at this time of year, my personal favorite besides bamboo shoots are fava beans. And it's a good example because if you've ever uh, shelled fresh fava beans, you know that there's a lot of what would appear to be scrap or waste. Um, the answer is it's not. It makes a gorgeous broth, a gorgeous flavored broth that's used then to cook the rice and the beans are then added in afterwards. Um, so there are tons of opportunities to do uh, repurpose and to think of creative uses of bits and pieces before you would throw it out. Um, another is kenshin jiru, which is the soup that's on the lower left. Um, it's a hodgepodge, but it's also an opportunity to uh, put a lot of th nourishing things, bits and pieces. You've got a bit of lotus root that's left because fingers are always more important than food when you're chopping and you're gonna be left with a chunk at the end save those up and then make a soup out of it. Um, another is sokuseki, which I call impatient pickles. Um, you've got a little bit of cucumber, a little bit of cabbage, the same thing about the cabbage. Your fingers are more important than the last piece of cabbage. Uh, so instead of uh, trying to shred everything the same, put it aside and make uh, uh, an instant pickle out of it. And then kimpira, which is immediately above it and, and beneath the list, is sort of a stir fry and it gets finished off with um, the spices and peels that you would remove from daikon, from carrots, a little bit of, especially bell peppers in, in America, I remember as being very large. Here in Japan, they tend to be smaller and inevitably you'd have a piece left over. All of those are wonderful opportunities. So let's take a look at the next slide. I want to make sure you understand that practicing kancha in the kitchen does not have to be Japanese food. All of the examples I've given thus far are Japanese food because that's my thing. Um, but using food fully and using all edible parts of everything prepared in many ways can be done with any kind of cuisine, any cuisine. Um, I found that um, my time in America, usually soup, sandwiches, salads, pasta, stews, casseroles. Um, I probably should add sheet pan um, dinners are, are another popular way. Um, all of these are opportunities to utilize bits and pieces that are the um, byproduct, if you will, of having used them for another major purpose in another way. And all of these are really quite in, um, in sync with SDGs and um, they've become also very popular at the, the, and the notion of SDG um, and it is SDG in Japanese um, has become uh, quite popular here. Um, so let's go to the last um, slide. And that is for your future inspiration and assistance. I encourage you to take a look at my website. There's lots of resources there. I have a kitchen culture blog. And then those of you who are on Facebook, please join the Kitchen Culture Cooking Club. Um, it's now about 11, 1200 strong um, and welcome people to interact there. So with that, I thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That really was enlightening. And I'm sure our audience is just probably salivating. It depends on what time of day, I guess. <laughs> and Elizabeth, in, in everyone in Japan, it's the morning. So right. you might have just finished breakfast. Uh, for many of us, uh, East Coast, Central time zone in the United States, we're, in the, in, you know, we're going to be eating dinner very soon. So now to, to have our next part of the conversation, I'd like to invite Rona Thiessen to, the, I guess, the stage. Uh, let me just share a little bit about Rona. She is the Executive Vice President for Ituan North America, uh, sorry, Executive Vice President for Public Relations and Marketing. And I'll, I'll share some more information in the, the chat box. 
Uh, let me just share also a little bit about Itowin in case you're not familiar with the company. We're also really happy they moved their U.S. headquarters into the Dallas area recently, but they also they have a strong following across the world in addition to the United States. So a little more about Itowin. It has received numerous awards, including recognition as one of 50 companies changing the world by fortune for its commitment to sustainability and the revitalization of tea farms through its tea region development project. So Rona, please feel free to begin. Well, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be a part of this special event. And Elizabeth, um, you've, we've been friends for years, but what an honor to be here with you. And I have, you Don't know, worry. your presentation was so informative and insightful. And um, quite honestly, I'm feeling quite disappointed that for all these years, I've been discarding my rice water, which I had no idea. Um, as well as daikon, I use daikon quite a bit, but didn't realize there was an anatomy to a daikon with the, Absolutely. the taste and, and all that. Um, but I must say when it comes to green tea and you touched on that, um, it's something that certainly I remember my Japanese grandmother sweeping her tatami um, with the tea leaves. And I also remember being in a taxi, um, it was early sixties and um, the taxi driver in the back had a plate of um, damp tea leaves that you know that he had discarded and you know i had no idea and he said it was to deodorize his car so you right. know thank you for touching on that <laughs> so it really is amazing you're just like a wealth of knowledge um and and was very excited to hear about your takenoko the bamboo yes um you know because it's one of my favorite dishes but the sustainability of the bamboo plant is, is really quite uh known for, uh, it, it's just an amazing renewable plant apparently that takes very little water and all that. So it's kind of full circle. Um, so, you know, I, I have a question because, you know, Kansha and number one, I am grateful and Kansha to be here talking with you. Likewise. Um, when did you first, you know, because I know you are from New York and I say you moved to Japan you know, how did, how were you first introduced to Kansha? Um, you know, how did that become part of your uh, yeah. introduction to the Japanese culture? I don't know that I had an aha moment. I think it was sort of a, a process. I landed up in Japan in the 60s. Um, ikinari, as they say, not with any intention, but landed up. I call it serendipity that got me here. Um, definitely um, the Ando household. And my mother-in-law, or the woman who at the time would become my mother-in-law, she was not yet my mother-in-law. Um, so people often ask which came first, and the answer is Japan came before being married to a Japanese. Um, and um, observing the way she managed that household, it was um, extraordinary. She was responsible for feeding uh, everybody who was at the, um, the factory, the Ando household had a factory, um, as well as a large household and managed um, to do it with um, grace and um, frugal, <laughs> uh, which was, was quite amazing. I had come from, um, a, a, my upbringing was one where I was never aware of utilizing things. I thankfully was fed whenever I was hungry and uh, had all the necessities of life, but I had never really given any thought to it before coming to Japan. Um, the person who gave me the vocabulary to talk about it was indeed my mother-in-law when she was my mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I would probably attribute it to um, my mother-in-law for, for the putting the, connecting the dots Right. About Kansha. Well, that's amazing. Um, do you feel that, um, you know, Kansha is something, is it spoken about often? I mean, is it something that's, or is it just sort of an inherent understanding within the culture, um, just overall? I think it's a practice mm -hmm. and it's by example, and you will hear the word um, and or a phrase. Um, in terms of people, Osewa ni narimasu. I'm in your debt. I'm I'm indebted to you for having done that. But I think the the mindset is um, 
And I think of it as a mindset right. um, and also a set of habits uh, that people practice. Um, but I think it tends to be less verbalized and more practiced. Right. So do you feel, I mean, you know, it's wonderful seeing those children learning, you know, the skills of, um, you know, the, the, the fish and, and right. knife skills. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Yes. Yes. Um, but learning from a very young age, appreciation of food, you know, the kansha and, and being interactive with it. Um, do you feel and, that, you know, yeah. today, a lot of the young generation, you know, the busy, modern, right. busy generation, um, do, the, do you think they do take the time to take pause and really think about, you know, the ingredients and um, uh, interacting with the food? Today, I, I, I mean, think, we're kind of in the world of tech today, so yeah. I'm just curious. Um, I think every once in a while, Kansha has different um, avenues of expression. <laughs> yes, and yes. you would hear um, uh, somebody um, saying, wow, I'm so glad I've got a microwave. That's Kansha. <laughs> Yes, that's um, true. That's or true. I Convenience. Can, the freezer. Um, and I, I'm not sure that they're using the word kansha uh, I don't think you're going to hear that as a formal statement, but I think you're going to hear people referring to clever gadgets, right. uh, clever technology, um, access to markets. Uh, boy, I'm so lucky to have a farmer's market in my neighborhood. Um, right. I, I think that that is very active and uh, mindful in terms of its, its present in people's thinking. Right. I'm not sure that the word kansha in a full sentence stop um, is heard very often. Right. Well, it's funny that you should mention, you know, technology, because I mean, one of Itoen, which we've taken pride on, is the you know, to be able to make a unsweetened, you know, brewed green tea um, on the go. That was a huge breakthrough in Japan because it was said you couldn't uh, brew because green tea would oxidize. And so of course, you know, right. we were able to, to bottle or can um, green tea and taste, you know, authentically brewed as if it was just right. at the moment. So it is interesting that things do evolve. Uh, for technology. Um, they, they do. And again, it has to do with the clever, resourceful people who are impacting on what nature provides. Right. So nature providing something is not enough. Right. That's, the be that's the beginning of the process. And then it's people. And I think one of the other um, things that's been more emphasized recently is a sense of responsibility in utilizing those resources yes. and the stewardship, if you will, of uh, the land, the sea, um, and being more mindful of, of yes. those. Um, but I would say that probably um, busy people are busy. Yes. Um, and uh, one of the best ways to manage, I think, is to, to pray ahead. Uh, right. I, I think it's a, it's a paradigm shift in the kitchen in terms of your ordinary habits right. and um, thinking ahead. It doesn't have to be difficult or very time consuming. You just have to have it done. Right. Uh -huh. Well, I think it, you know, it, it is so important when you're busy, you're so grateful for that simple convenience. Um, you know, I often think that, you know, sometimes I overbuy things and things kind of spoil. And so you really have to plan things out. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because I know there's a lot of, uh, um, businesses that, that they actually now send you pre-prepared meals that you assemble. So they say a lot of it is there's no food waste for that, you know. Um, and I know people who do order these uh, sort of right. kits. Um, so that's kind of an interesting concept too. And I'm sure people have it is. gratitude I'm, I'm, for that. I'm hoping that the people who provide those kits are mindful in their own facilities yes, <laughs> that yes, they're not yes, uh, but yes. I'm sure they are because they're driven yeah. by the economics of 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 not right. wanting waste right. um, I mean I prefer doing everything myself but you know I think for for many people as you said you know right. how do they you kind of measure gratitude and so I guess many people are excited about that as well I I, I think that there's lots of ways of expressing it and it doesn't have to be 
um, doing everything from scratch. Yes, yes. Hmm. And you know, it's interesting because right now there's, um, you know, this plant-based lifestyle, which is right. really uh, becoming quite, people are embracing that. It's a healthier, I think people are so much more conscientious of yeah. having a healthier lifestyle. Um, they're very mindful of what they're bringing into their body. Um, right. You know, I know green tea, people are, are really excited about incorporating that into their diet. Are there any ingredients or um, things that you've come across that you you don't feel is, let's say, sustainable or that uh, you suggest to steer away from? Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, I would say those that are over-processed. Uh, yes. what, what the process, you, you want to do most of the processing yourself if at all possible. Um, and certainly when people go shopping here in Japan, particularly the foreign community that might not be fluent in reading Japanese, I always say a good way to look is at the back label. And if it's a long list, it's probably not good. Um, and then I teach them the one character they need to know, nado, which means et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. And whenever you <laughs> see that at the end of the list, you definitely don't want to buy it. Right. Um, but the less you need to do to something before you consume it, the better. And there are certain foods that are more naturally inclined towards that. Um, but when you still have to manipulate it a lot, um, for example, a corn on the cob, but that's also, and people, they're gonna get in their little packet afterwards of recipes, a, a corn, corn and rice dish, um, right. the silk, the husks, the cob itself make wonderful broth again for making takikomi gohan. Yeah, so there's so, no point, so, so. or you can make a suri nagashi, a pureed soup out of it. There's oh. no need to uh, waste it in the normal sense of the word, as in discarding it without another use. Yeah. So I think that um, it takes a lot of different forms of expression. And some of them may be grateful for technology. Uh, right. Others may be grateful for um, being able to go to a depachika, a department store food hall, and buy it already made. <laughs> um, if, if you haven't been, we highly recommend, right? You've got to well, experience it. <laughs> um, it. Unfortunately, there's been a lag in the depachika world in terms of containers, and there's still a lot of plastic that's not great. Um, but people are, are working on alternatives. Um, so that they're not producing quite as much um, problematic yes. uh, garbage in the process. Um, well, so I would say there aren't ingredients to either embrace or avoid so much as the way they're presented. And the less um, waste is going to be created in the process of transforming it from an ingredient to a nourishing food, yes. better. Yes, and people are looking for nourishing foods, um, and obviously, particularly during this pandemic, and people want to sort of build their immunity and, and so forth. You know, when you mentioned takikomi gohan, um, you know, I know that um, many people also with green tea, we've seen many people use our uh, oyochar, our green tea with rice um, and cooking with it. So it, I think it's thinking outside the box and, you know, right kind of being creative. And as you know, uh, matcha has become so big um, yes. here in the United States. And as you know, it's traditionally used in tea ceremony, but some of the applications and incorporating oh. in recipes have been really pretty amazing. Um, they have, um, matcha is, is everywhere. The only caution I would give to people who haven't yet cooked with it in the kitchen is, um, if you need to heat it, it's low, slow. Yes. <laughs> uh, high heat will kill it. Um, will kill the flavor, the color, yes. and also to some extent, the, the, yes. the nutrition. Yes. Um, so yeah. if you were to um, recommend, I mean, are you using any American techniques uh, that maybe are not necessarily um, hide in Japanese cooking or? It's, it's interesting, again, as I, mentioned, I grew up in a household where I was never in, in need or want, but I was never part of the process of, of making it. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother um, was never a cook, <laughs> uh, 
per se. Uh, there were other people in the household who were cooking uh, instead. And I had never given any thought to it. So I didn't really learn to cook until I had come to Japan. Well, that's um, so amazing. I don't know if there's a, a brief moment for a, a story. So I, I finally got a chance to go to Europe. I, I My first foreign adventure was coming to Japan. I sort of got, I stayed here. Um, was um, when my husband had business in Paris and I said, I've never been, I'm going to go. Um, and Lavarin was um, oh. teaching and teaching in English. Um, and I had contacted them about a week before, so I decided I was going to sign up for the course. Um, I was put in with another group of Americans and I was having a lot of trouble following, even though, uh, I mean, it was translated into English. And I heard in the hallway Japanese. And so I asked the administrator, is there a group from Japan? She said, yes. I said, put me in with them. And <laughs> the rest of the week, I was with the Japanese women learning French cooking in Japan. And it clicked. It all made sense. Oh, my God. That's so and the interesting. And final, the final exam was to make a souffle. And we whisked it with wooden chopsticks. And oh did it my faster goodness, how interesting. than the sensei with his... Goodness. So that's true east-west in many ways. I, I, I guess so, but it was my default. So my <laughs> default in the kitchen, which is helpful in some ways and not in others. So I, I'm not the greatest um, translator for people who are working in an American kitchen. Uh -huh. um, so my default mode is a Japanese kitchen. Um, well, you've done an amazing job. I, I know I'm always so enamored with your newsletters and all the... <laughs> Um, areas that you touch on and you know I have to share just a cute little story because you're talking about using and sustainability I remember going in Japan to a Japanese uh, restaurant Kaiseki and you know how gorgeous the presentations are right. and it was this one dish and you know carefully with my chopsticks and when the server came to pick up the plate she said you can eat the little basket and we looked at this exquisite little woven basket and it was actually woven kombu. with kombu exactly right. and I was so taken um at, you know this exquisite basket I'm I can eat this and they said yes <laughs> so you know it kind of touched on um, what you're talking right. about uh, using everything using everything and um it, it's often surprising um uh, especially when presented to guests um again that that cleverness of being yes. able to uh, present everything I love um, fried kombu strips, which is what oh. I mean, it's woven out of kombu strips and then deep fried and they're wonderful. I don't make my own little baskets, I must admit. Right. <laughs> that is quite food. tedious, I can imagine. Well, but, you know, it's interesting. True. Somebody I just noticed in the chat and, and she kind of commented that. Um, uh, did you mention about green tea leaves? You can put it on your face. And I yeah. have to say that, you know, uh, as you had mentioned earlier that, you know, it has this antiviral, antibacterial right. aspects. And yes, I know a lot of um, beauty masks are made with, with tea. Right. Um, and of course, I remember my Japanese grandmother saying gargle with green tea because, you know, right. it's good for... Um, Very for definitely person. gargling with, um, with green tea. Yes. Um, and uh, when the pandemic first took hold here, that was another... Uh, thing that was encouraged rather than plain water was to use tea for gargling yeah well I have to say um, honestly I think you really have brought a whole new mindset for all of us um, and, mm -hmm. and really kind of reassessing what's in our refrigerators and how we can sort of incorporate I love that you showed you know the Japanese uh, pictures and and food dishes, but that you also kind of referred to some of the, you know, the stews and the casseroles and all that, and right. that you really can, you know, I always say sort of thinking outside the box and um, being inventive in all. I have two little um, sort of containers in my refrigerator uh, ongoing for scraps. And um, the, the two are separated primarily by those that have, um, odor or other things that could impact on um, being kept. And um, I check in on them at least twice a week. Is that so right? as, as I'm working, I'm going to um, 
put the little bit of carrot, the little bit of onion uh, in one of those boxes. And it often is what um, is the impetus for another meal. Uh, is that right? Wow. Yeah. Now you touched on furikake. Right. So is furikake something, I mean, you know, I know they sell them in the stores and all, but is that something that one can create their own? Uh, Absolutely. Result? Absolutely. So the secrets with, with the furikake, because you know, there's a big food, trend with furikake um, out here in the United States. I didn't realize that. Well, yes. so um, give me a little time and I'll send an extra recipe. I didn't think to put in a recipe oh, for goodness, furikake. Um, but- uh, and, I, and for those who don't know what furikake is, maybe you can, can you elaborate a little bit? Sure. And uh, well, uh, kakeru means to put on top and furu means to sort of, sprinkle or distribute. So furikake is sprinkles, I guess. Um, yes. Uh, they're not sweet though. I When you use the word sprinkles or jimmies, if people are coming from Boston, um, you think of something on top of ice cream, but these are typically savory. Furikake are typically savory. And unfortunately they are typically loaded with junk when they are commercially prepared. Um, don't know that I have time for another story, but when my daughter was um, little and cute and she was born and raised originally in, in Tokyo, um, there was a cartoon character on television um, and uh, the container for uh, Taiyaki-kun uh, contained furikake that was filled with junk. And the oh, usual, anybody who has little kids and goes to the supermarket, the usual temper tantrums, Oh, I think, Elizabeth, are you on mute? We can't hear you. I think we kind of lost. She had a play oh, date? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, we, we missed you for a few minutes. Maybe you can back up a little on that. Okay. Um, so uh, my daughter, when she was little, had the temper tantrum in, in the supermarket. And I, the easiest way out of the supermarket was to buy the thing. And when I got home, I threw out the contents of the container and put my own furikake in it. Um, and, well, that was great. But then one of her friends came to, to um, or actually she went to a friend's house. And I get a phone call from the friend's um, mother um, saying that your daughter just spit out the rice which is oh, goodness. horrible um, because she had seen the container and figured that it was going to be what was in there and I explained that I had switched out and I gave the recipe to the mother and and all was well and um afterwards but typically junk is in the prepared one so you want to make your own yeah and so I will um that would I will fantastic. try to get get you a an extra. I yes. had prepared some printouts already that hopefully will people will get, um, but I hadn't thought to put furikake in there. We'll do that. Oh, yeah, please do. And, and I think there's even furikake that you can maybe throw some green tea in, right, uh, Elizabeth? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. I will, I will, and I'll try to do a vegan version and a regular yeah. one, which is my usual uh, attempt to, to so meet I'll, those people. Who... One last question, because I know you touched on, and, and you know, traditionally I know in Japan they have the ochazuke. Right. Is that something that is, again, using everything and applying that? You it's know, certainly- it from that, do you think? Um, it certainly it, is. Um, Again, because it's a little bit more complicated to make, especially in households where people are not regularly eating Japanese meals, I didn't think to include it uh, along with takikomi gohan and- Right, and, right. You know, well, I just came to think of it because, you know, obviously, you know, you talked about rice and of course, okay. coming from so, green tea, I was curious. Again, I don't think it, it was one of the links that it's up on my website already. I don't think that um, it was one of the links. So I'm going to, I'm just making a note to myself, ochazuke and furikake. And let me go take a look again at what's already up on my website and what um, might not already be there. Great, great. And we'll try to get- I mean, I have to you. agree with Paul. I think our mouths were are watering. I mean, talking about all this delicious uh, 
Good. Good. And of course, I think you really sparked a lot of uh, um, interest for all of us to sort of roll up our sleeves and okay. really think about, you know, the ingredients that we use and applying it. Yeah, I hope so. And, and to look at it as an opportunity, not to think that somebody's going to slap your hand if you don't do yes. it right, but this right. is an opportunity for a creative expression and, and how clever can you be? And it's just wonderfully satisfying when you're able to use up everything. Yes, less to garbage to take out, right? <laughs> right. Um, and those people, and I think a couple of you people are online there uh, who have been in my programs before, and uh, several of the people who have assisted me in programs um, before have always been amazed at how little garbage there is at the end of a program. That's um, amazing. And uh, we, we've consumed it, not, not, not as garbage, but um, certainly uh, don't, not producing, thinking from the very start about creatively using everything. Right, right. So it's a different- well, I think when you, you showed uh, the SDG, you know, the sustainable right. uh, goals, the United right. Nations, and when we think of, you know, food waste and all that, it is important to really have less. Um, to it, make really, a difference that way. it really cumulatively impacts. It, it, it sounds like a little sort of um, silly thing when it's each individual, uh, what's a carrot peel going to do? Right. Uh, but the answer is cumulatively, it makes a huge difference. Um, yes. And even in your own life, in terms of what you're consuming, the other question I often get asked is um, whether eating organic is really essential or not. And the answer mm -hmm. is if it's something that you're going to be eating more than two or three times a week, you should be giving a lot of thought to what it is. Right. If it's something you're gonna eat once a year or once a month even, it, it's probably not going to have that kind of an impact. Right. Um, so for each person that may be something different. Um, well, I, I think, you know, with more awareness, I think, you know, we are seeing that people are becoming much more mindful of what they are eating. And, you know, there is obviously a lot more um, you know, organic and, and, and people are really also growing a lot of their own um, herbs and plants and, and, and vegetables. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's wonderful. It, it um, really is. A lot of people on uh, the Kitchen Culture Cooking Club will often be people who are actually gardening or harvesting from their own gardens, or certainly who have access to a lot of um, uh, fresh produce. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always, you know, what else can you do with um, zucchini if you're growing zucchini? <laughs> um, it's a challenge, but you'll come up with something. Um, and I think the probably the origins of this Kancha mindset was the vagaries of nature and not always having a steady su food supply. Right. So either you're going to have too much or you're going to have too little. And that, then what are you going to do so that you can every day you get hungry on a regular basis? But how can you satisfy that hunger when your food source is not constant yes. or consistent? Um, and we didn't get a chance to talk about the different ways of preserving, uh, fermentation, drying, and all the rest of it. That but, will have uh, to be the next, next the one. Next time. <laughs> There'll be a series. Invite me, <laughs> invite me back again. Well, I think given this time when, you know, uh, we hear so much about supply chain, you know, it really does make you think about how important, you know, the, the, the supply chain is and sometimes taking it into your own hands and, you know, growing your own is really, right. um, you've got control. So, and yeah. plus it really is um, so much, you have such kasha and gratitude, I think, when you see, a, 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 you know, vegetable or fruit grow and you get to enjoy the, the fruits yeah. of that. Right. Yes. And um, for certainly from the 1970s, which was when my daughter was little and in school here in Japan, um, children were part of farming in their school's neighborhood. And the difference in growing a vegetable and then eating it and buying the vegetable and eating yes. it is huge, huge. Yes. Um, and it, again, it's experiential. Um, 
Well, when you were showing the, the children the food education, um, right. you know, I went to a, a Shogaku elementary school in Japan for a while. And I remember, you know, it was the kids who put their little jackets on and their little hats, hats right? and we served and masks. <laughs> yes, masks, and we served our students. And I think I was like in second grade. Yeah. And I remember that um, fondly because it was sort of a, a group activity and communal and we took part in serving our classmates right um, and, so and was... cleaning up also yes yes so it, it's a so. full cycle of uh, prepping cooking serving eating yes. and cleanup yes and it's, a, it's a unit if you will yes yeah. which is wonderful because it gives you kind of tools for you know right being out in the world in many ways so indeed but uh this has really been so amazing elizabeth you you never cease to amaze me and again you know i have your cookbooks i've always admired you um and so it's quite exciting because i'm sure people have been very inspired um and i'm sure there's lots of questions um which i'm sure paul is uh probably <laughs> going to go through um but oh there's paul right there how are we on time paul i know you gave us i guess a i i think it'd be good we can go to the audience questions and let me know okay. rona if you if you have trouble accessing wonderful oh, okay so oh goodness i see like a lots of activity <laughs> here yeah um oops sorry yeah. you can go directly into the q a for oh, the event. well yeah. i am but i don't see open Oh, I drink a. So if you look in the I, answered section. So. Yes. Okay. I drink a lot of tea, not just green tea. Do you know of uses for tea beyond Japanese green tea? Well, yes. I mean, there's a whole palette of different it's, varieties. It's the tea. same leaf. Yes. Uh, all really all tea is, is the yeah. same leaf. Yes. Yeah. So presumably, and, you can do the same things with kocha, ulon cha. Exactly. The leaf is the same. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, as Elizabeth said, a lot of people are not aware that black tea and, and you know, oolong tea and They're green the tea is the one plant. plant. Yes. <laughs> it's the one yeah. plant. Camellia sinensis. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so it's, here's another question. Uh, what do you think of people who have a hard time with grasping the nature of where food comes from? Like, I know people who would be uncomfortable if given a whole fish to prepare here in the U.S. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a very good question. It is, and people are often nonplussed when they come here and they're presented fish with head, tail, and possibly even guts still in them, depending upon the variety and what, what's being um, served. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a hard thing, especially as an adult, if you've not been seeing it and experiencing it around you, it's a, it's a hard thing to come by. For, for me personally, I think it was less... a uh, overcoming a sense of revulsion, then it was the dexterity to be able to eat it without injury to myself and without extreme um, embarrassment um, around me. Uh, and I actually um, begged a, a, a neighbor at the time and a friend to give me lessons in eating fish. Uh, because I was so Im embarrassed um, at, at the mess that I made of it. So I don't know that other people need to go to that extent, um, but I think that there are now certainly online and on YouTube, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of tutorials about um, that, but making the connection. So I don't know how many American children make the connection between the milk that they drink and the animal, the cow. Interesting. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I, think, I think it's an issue for every food culture right. to encourage making the connection. Well, I grew up as well, you know, eating the whole fish with the head and grilled. And to me, that was considered the ultimate freshness and appreciation. So I think a lot of it is just, you know, um, exposure and, and being introduced to it and then getting comfortable with it. Um, you know, I think there's like the, the Greek culture, I think Branzini with the whole fish as well. So um, we're seeing more and more, I think, people getting a little bit more comfortable 
with yeah. uh, another little sort of story. Um, Rena was still quite little when we were in America and at a restaurant and the fish was brought out and the waiter filleted it for us and then was about to take away everything that wasn't the fillet. And oh. Rena actually <laughs> said, don't you dare <laughs> so bring funny. that back. And the answer <laughs> was we went to, went to work on what was left. Um, so, I mean, this was maybe 30, 35 years ago, something like that. But yes, the assumption was that everything else was going to be taken away. And the answer was, oh, no, no, no. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I remember being in uh, Tsukiji and there was a Fugu school, you know, the, the Blowfish school, right. and they were trained to uh, separate, you know, what you the can left the liver, you which can't. Can't. Yes. Right. And they, they had two trays. And it was really fascinating to see the skill and being able to identify everything. So, you know, I think uh, that was quite an interesting, uh, but you have to rely on a good fugu chef, right. I'm sure. But I have another great question here. Somebody yeah. has um, uh, asked, and this, might kansha in the kitchen be connected to other cultural aspects like customs or volumes from Buddhism or Shintoism that you can speak on? Um, definitely. And um, the word motayanai, which usually is translated as, oh, what a shame you've mm -hmm. said, almost with somebody slapping your hand, oh, you should, motayanai is what Rena was screaming to the waiter to bring yeah. back the fish. Don't you dare throw that out. It's motayanai. Um, has origins in, in Buddhism. And I think that um, the, the mindfulness of life and, um, Itadako, there's even a different verb that shows respect for what you are receiving. Mm -hmm. right. So itadako and itadakimasu, which you say before you eat, is a word of respect. And I think yeah. that, um, so, but I think that the learning to say that happens probably earlier than the actual awareness of what it means, which comes a bit later. But yes. I think that's true of every food culture. Yes, uh, would have to agree on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, another great question here. Which section of the daikon is used for uh, miso pickling? Miso pickling. Probably, it, it, are you wanting it to be spicy? It would be the tip. Mm -hmm. Because um, in, in the skeru process, you're not applying heat. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the spiciness is not going to um, dissipate. Um, and if you want it to be somewhat spicy, you would be using the, um, the tip. Otherwise, the center section probably will have the most pleasant texture mm -hmm. and the right density. Mm -hmm. it, the, the neck is going to be too dense. The neck is used for other kinds of skemono where uh, either it's a long term or you're applying heat, something like hari hari zuke, uh -huh. um, where you're applying heat, because otherwise the texture of the neck is is going to be wrong. Now, is I have heard, is it is there like a spring daikon and a winter daikon? Well, there is, so right? Daikon is um, harvested year round, right. but uh, traditionally you think of it as a cold weather veggie, right. but there is summer versions and the summer versions tend to be more porous and more mizu mizu shi they've got mm -hmm, more liquid mm -hmm. in there um which can both be problematic and wonderful so right. if you're trying to make oroshi and you've got just a mm. lot of liquid which is um, one of my favorites is the daikoroshi i love the right. grated well don't throw the liquid out what Thank should you, you Okay. I'm saving yeah. every liquid from now on for my rice, for my daikon. So when you're doing your daikon oroshi, you'll put a cloth or something that can trap the oroshi over a, a dish or a jar that can take the, the liquid. And that liquid, um, if you can stand to gargle with it, that will kill almost anything that's in the oh, back goodness. of your throat. But it's very, very, very strong. Yeah, I can um, imagine quite probably. But, it's, but it can be used for um, cooking other veggies and they will become tender. In other words, it breaks down the fibers of oh, other. That's interesting. Yeah. Goodness. And we have one other very interesting question too. For new cooks, sometimes it's difficult to think of ways to use the food scrap 
and create a new dish. What's your advice? Save it. You can always toss it later. <laughs> so, so to think in terms of a three to five day cycle. Um, and if you think that within five days, you might be able to use it somehow, it's worth saving. Check in on it two or three days later, but don't wait for the full five. And if it's beyond the pale, you're just going to toss it at, at that point. Um, I would say that basically you should think of changing the shape of it. So the most uh, extreme would be to blend it and mm -hmm. make a puree. Is that In other words, if, if, if your scrap is bruised or discolored or uh, you're not wanting it to remain as a whole piece because it's going to be unattractive or, or right. uh, unnecessary, then grate it, puree it, make it as fine and chopped up as possible. If the texture of it is wonderful and it could be a crunch uh -huh. uh, or a good chew, then try to keep it whole. So I would think rather of the seasoning, I would think of the shape that you're uh -huh. going to be changing it into. The second use, the shape is Definitely. probably going to be more important than the flavoring. That's very interesting. I don't think I ever would have imagined thinking shape. But, you know, in the chat, I, somebody just shared that their mother-in-law would um, soak a daikon in honey for almost like a cough syrup, which I thought was interesting. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love all these, you know, home remedies um, that uh, people have shared like, from their mother-in-laws or their grandparents and all. The and, wisdom of the ancients. Yes, yes. And I, I literally have to say, when my Japanese grandmother used to say, gargle with green tea, I used to poo-poo her. And I'd say, oh, an old wives' tale. Well, of course, then I became <laughs> part of Itoen and learned Little about did she know. the great antioxidants, right. <laughs> vitamin C. Little did I know. Literally. But there's a lot of truth to a lot of that. So yes. it's pretty amazing. So well, the other the other um thing is that if generations <clears throat> of people have been doing something, yes. it's gotta be meaningful. Uh somewhere along the line, <clears throat> excuse me, I what I really need is green tea. Um well here, can I can I deliver some oyocha to you over there? I would love, I would love it. <laughs> I put I put mine. I actually have tea in there, but I, oh, it's a bug, so that it's easier for me to drink. Um, it's um, if people have been doing it for generations, mm -hmm. centuries, millennia. There's got to be a way of doing it safely and well, and it had to be good, or people yes. wouldn't continue to do it. Yes. So looking back for ideas about what to do now. There's a lot of resources there. Not all of them are applicable any longer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there's a tremendous resource in um, the history of people's kitchen activity. Right, right. Yes, and when we look at history, I often say, goodness, you know, tea's been around. Uh, I mean, it start, people say, well, they drink green tea for the health benefits. And I say, well, it, it originally started as a medicine. You yes. Know, so. So there is so much truth to history and how, you know, it certainly has uh, maintained its, uh, how would you say, uh, reputation in a sense. Right, right. But um, the, so the, other, the other food that's often used in, in medicinal ways is, is ginger. So the yes. combination of ginger, honey, and daikon is also yes. um, often put together um, and tea. So there are lots of... Uh, Nodo Ahmed uh, throat drops mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are made of um, tea and uh, daikon and yeah. So the the modern application has been to make these cough drops, if you will. But um, those have been used for for centuries. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how things come back. So maybe we'll be seeing that on the market soon. Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> yes. Yes. So curiously, and I, I know you had mentioned that your daughter is going to be visiting after years um, and your little granddaughter. Right. Is there something special that you are going to be excited to introduce her to back in Japan? Well, the, the request. A little, I'm sure. 
Yeah, but the request was um, lots of cucumbers in the nuka pot. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Yeah. Oh, the the um the, 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 the nuka the pickles. The, um, yes. When, oh when, my gosh. When my yeah. daughter was little, that was one of her favorites, and um, somebody so, just my, my nuka pot's in good shape right now, and um, there's definitely going to be probably only three will fit in there. But that well, I'm be. awfully envious because it was my favorite too. And uh, mm -hmm. so I can uh, agree with Irina and her request. Yeah. Okay, great. So, but uh, anyway, I have to say, Elizabeth, I know I think we've gone over a little time, but this has been just absolutely incredible. And I've seen so many amazing chats that I think they're inspired mm -hmm. and uh, sharing their experiences. And hopefully we can do this again. I hope so, um, and, and hopefully those can be shared later because um, with these glasses, which are necessary for me to see the screen, I can't see and read anything that's going on in the chat box. That's all right, no, that's um, all right. And, and yes. I know you have some recipes to share as yes. well. And I um, will um, uh, add uh, ochazuke and furikake uh, and somehow yes. get that to you folks um, before too long, also trying to get the next newsletter out before the end of the week. Please do. <laughs> and if people want to cook with tea, we also at itoen.com have some tea recipes that you can use Great. for cooking and all that. So I think uh, people will be covered with, with both of our, our areas. Great. And uh, this has been really an absolute delight. It's a um, wonderful way for me to start the day. And, oh, my uh, goodness. And for here, it's evening. But, okay. Uh, and thank you, um, you know, to, to Paul for having invited us for this great uh, you, conversation. Yes, so. uh, truly please great. Stay goal. safe. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. Please, yeah. And we will all be back in our kitchen uh, and we'll have to share our experiences with you. Okay, we'll have great. to share. <laughs> thank you. All righty. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Rona. Thank you. Rona. Thank you so much for your time and your enthusiasm for sharing the wonders of Japanese culinary traditions. We also want to thank our attendees this evening or this morning for their willingness to learn and really their strong interest in this topic. Before we close, I'd like to share some upcoming Japan and America Society programs. And uh, just keeping in mind that I believe all of these, as we have scheduled, are in person. So if you are in the Dallas Fourth area, please come and join us. For those who are not in the Dallas Fourth area, we are planning some additional online events. Uh, there might be one in June and possibly some in the fall. So please just keep an eye out for that. So, first of all, we'd like to talk about our annual meeting. This is the first annual meeting we've had in person since 2019. We're really excited. It's going to be at St. Anne Court, which is part of the Harwood District in beautiful downtown Dallas. You'll be able to learn more about our current board members to celebrate our year, but also to learn about our incoming board members and to say thank you for some of our outgoing board members. And we'll have our, our general members join this program as well. And you'll be able to, in addition to having some wonderful food, you'll be able to see the Iron Man exhibition, which is part of the Samurai Collection. The Samurai Collection is actually the largest assembly of samurai artwork in the world outside of Japan. So please come and join us on May 3rd. Uh, next slide, Madoka. We also are going to have our inaugural summer camp. This is really, a, as I mentioned, a new program. It's gonna be June 6th through the 10th, and we'll be focusing on ages eight through 12. We'll be learning about Japanese culture, traditions, even some modern pop culture. So there'll be a session about manga, anime. So please come and join that event. And we, we are getting close to being sold out. So we'll probably close registration in mid-May. So if you want to take advantage of this, please go to our website and to, you can register. You can learn more about the program. Uh, again, we're really excited. This is our first ever summer camp. Next slide, please. We're also going to have our sake program coming back. This is the first time we've done this in person also since 2019. And it'll be Friday, July 15th. There's not a lot of information right now, but we are planning to have it at our building, which is in East Plano, near the intersection of George Bush Turnpike and US 75. And then I think we have just maybe one more slide, one or two. Okay. And uh, yes, also please, our award dinner will be coming up. Uh, this is a higher priced event, but if you're able to join, we really appreciate that. We'll be honoring Sean Donahue, the CEO of Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, and then Hidito Nashitani, who is 
a longtime supporter, also has been involved uh, in many positions with Oryx, and uh, he's just a wonderful supporter of, of the Japan American Society of Dallas for Fort Worth. And then also, we don't have a slide for it. Uh, we'll be just closing in a minute, but if you are in the Plano area, please come to the Plano Asia Fest on Saturday, May 7th. This is the first time this event has been in person in a few years, and the Japan American Society will have a booth to celebrate Japanese culture. It's also very close to Children's Day in Japan. So that is all we have for this evening. Thank you so much for joining. And we'll, again, we'll be sharing a follow-up email very soon with information about what Elizabeth had mentioned, some of the links, but then also a follow-up and a link to the recording of this program. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great evening for those in the U.S. and great morning and rest of the day for those in Japan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank Bye. you.